but uh, I have to start because otherwise I won't make it to the demo uh, and I'm, I'm afraid that I won't make it anyway. Uh, you can maybe see it on the internet if I, or try it for yourself. Um, if I won't make it, uh, I'm Lubosz Sanetsky. Uh, I work at Kolabova and today I'm gonna give you a, a small overview of VR on Linux in general and maybe a panoramic video in VR which is a big part of the industry in VR right now because it's easy to create content. You just, just need a camera and the, the right software pipeline to do it. Uh, and yeah, uh, sorry about the epicness in the title, but I'm a futurist and also a big VR enthusiast. That's why I'm looking forward to all the stuff. Um, and if you see the timeline of relevant consumer HMDs, uh, or if I look at it, I have to think of me 20 years ago when I ordered this on eBay in the US. Um, it was the Nintendo Virtual Boy, if, if, if you like, the first consumer uh, HMD available. Of course, it didn't have any tracking and it had monochrome rendering. It was really shitty and not immersive at all. Uh, but it had uh, one thing that's common with current VR headsets and that's stereo rendering. Of course, stereoscopy is not that impressive. You know, if you're in the cinema and watch a 3D movie, a stereoscopic movie, uh, you lose the idea of having a stereo after 10 minutes uh, and you just have like the annoying glasses. Um, but uh, it's limited. Uh, so stere stereoscopy is limited to a certain amount of effects that don't that you don't notice uh, all of the time. But uh, like in real VR, when you can walk around stuff and uh, go closer, then it's a totally different thing because you choose the perspective. But so uh, let's look at the real timeline of consumer HMDs. Um, it's ob obviously it starts with the Oculus DK1. Uh, which was introduced or consumer available in 2013. I was very happy that uh, this, uh, this Kickstarter started and got funded. And uh, yeah, they were selling like uh, five headsets a minute in the best times in the Kickstarter. So it got really popular. Uh, what you have in the Oculus is basically a phone display uh, with phone sensors, so an uh, EMU sensor. Uh, which does uh, like a gyroscope and an accelerometer, um, which does basic head tracking. And with that, uh, the dawn of VR was here. So uh, because the Oculus DK1 is just like a cheap phone in a plastic case, uh, Google came and say, why not make an even cheaper case and you can put your phone in yourself. And it's like 20 bucks instead of uh, 300. Um, that's why the cardboard project uh, was created uh, later, in 2014, uh, you could just buy a cardboard like for 20 bucks and have a poor VR experience uh, with that. Uh, but uh, when I first had uh, like just emu tracking on my head, uh, I saw the Unreal Engine 3 roller coaster. I was very impressed because I saw nothing like that before and I was sick for 45 minutes. Um, because uh, What's very important in VR is that you have the perfect immersion and if, uh, if your brain notices that something is not right, uh, many people, and me included, uh, get motion sick. That's why they thought, why, uh, well, m let's make it better, let's make the resolution better, let's improve the tracking. And in 2014, uh, then there came the DK2 without a Kickstarter, but you could order it from Oculus directly. Samsung also did a similar thing to cardboard, but not made uh, of paper, but uh, of plastic, and it had a nice touchpad, and you could put in your phone, so uh, it's also a rather cheap thing uh, which uh, can serve to a wide audience. I think Samsung ships the, the, the gear with a uh, lot of phones, um, yeah, uh, and... Uh, Another interesting project started like in 2015. Uh, it was uh, the Yoist VR 
HDK1. Uh, the H stands for hacker, so they, it was targeted uh, at a rather technical public. Uh, so uh, OSVR, open source virtual reality, uh, how they call them. Uh, it's a, rather a software project. I will talk about that later in detail. Um, that tries to provide uh, support for many devices, support for many uh, rendering engines, and they also provide a headset. Uh, the cool thing about the headset, so the first one was comparable to the DK2 from Oculus, but you could do stuff like uh, changing your screen and applying a better filter. So um, you had already a better quality than in the DK2 because of an optical filter. And of course, you could compile all of the software stack mostly uh, and use it on Linux. So uh, then uh, I would do like a imaginal line here, imaginary, uh, because this is where we are like right now. So this is 2016, and we see yeah, the stuff is uh, still yet about to start. Um, because 2016, the first real consumer headsets appeared on the market, like the CV1, the consumer version one, from Oculus, uh, uh, priced at the double price tag like the headset before, so it was like 600 bucks instead of 300. And um, the headset I have here, it's the HTC Vive. Uh, yeah, uh, it's a very nice headset. Uh, why that? Uh, why, why it's nice? Uh, uh, I will tell, talk later about that. But um, it, it, it did, did something really new uh, that wasn't done before. And uh, OSVR also released its second headset this year, uh, which has a resolution comparable to the CV1 and just better stats. But still, you can still replace like your stuff in there. And most recently, uh, Google thought, yeah, paper is not that nice. Well, let's do cloth. Uh, cloth is also uh, light, uh, so uh, Google Daydream will be released at the end of the year, and it does something different or something extra. Uh, it introduces a controller, but the controller is also just uh, tracked with an internal sensor, so it's not that amazing, not like the wife. But uh, yeah, the, the, the trend is that uh, the portable cheap headsets acquire more of the features of the high-end headsets, um, so that the consumer base grows and you, you have a bigger platform for VR. Let, let, let's look at the common setups uh, increasing uh, in tech uh, that you have in VR. So the most basic thing is the immu tracking, so it's immersal, uh, inertial measurement unit. That means it can just track your head's rotation um, and uh, that makes a uh, a decent VR experience. The immersion is not great, so uh, you, uh, you, your head gets tracked if you don't move too much. So uh, you don't, you, you cannot do things like that or, or like that. You, you can only do that. So uh, it's like very, very limited, but it's uh, really fine enough for panoramic video uh, because uh, you cannot do more than that in panoramic video nowadays anyway. So immune tracking is fine enough, that's why uh, panoramic video or, uh, is very popular on YouTube and uh, there are many companies that provide platforms and content because you just need like a piece of paper and some lenses and uh, done is the VR headset. So it's uh, the same technology as the DK1 uh, that you can find uh, in the cardboard. So what, what do we want? Uh, what do we want? So, uh, so we have like a better VR experience because we want to uh, have uh, experience similar to reality. We need to add some degrees of freedom. And uh, with, uh, uh, for that we need uh, external tracking. Uh, it's also possible with internal tracking but it's uh, far more complicated. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, so, so the solution was for the DK2 that uh, we had a grid of infrared emitters in, in the glasses, in, uh, in the headset, uh, which is not visible to the user. This, is, this was recorded, this picture was recorded with an infrared camera. Uh, it's really amazing because if you, when you look at the headset, it looks similar like this. Uh, uh, you don't see through this plastic, but uh, in fact, it's transparent in the infrared uh, spectrum. So uh, there was this camera. 
uh, with this infrared filter on it and uh, you you could do tracking. Uh, so it adds three degrees to freedom uh, of freedom uh, to the rotation we have before. Now we have also up, down, left, right, and forward, backward. Uh, and uh, that is a huge deal because you can do more complex applications than just uh, riding a roller coaster. You could uh, uh, do like a simple movement. But the movement uh, was very limited to the field of view of this small camera. Uh, so, obviously, what do we need to do? We need to add more cameras uh, and uh, then we have the so-called room-scale VR experience. Um, it was really introduced by the HTC Vive. The HTC Vive is shipped. It comes uh, with, with the Lighthouse tracking system uh, and uh, in contrary to in contrast to to the oculus uh, the the uh, tracking w works the other way around so in the base stations you have the emitter and in the headset you have the camera and that's a very smart idea because it's extensible that means you can have more controllers and stuff that just uses the same tracking system because uh, the sensor position is read from the headset and the external base stations are not connected uh, to the computer directly, so they communicate uh, with Bluetooth with, with this small black box, but um, in general you, you get the position, you track the position from the headset or the controllers. And Valve also introduced uh, like a, 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 a licensable uh, kit uh, where you can create your own hardware for the Lighthouse system. So the experience was not limited to sitting in front of your PC, but you couldn't move in, in the whole room. So the, the physical room is now the limit. So if you have walls, um, then you would hit them if you're in VR. That's why, uh, that's why uh, the physical walls are also shown uh, in virtual reality. You during calibration, you, you uh, have to scan your room and uh, then then you see the physical limit in virtual reality. So, uh, what else can we do? So we have now full room tracking. You think maybe now we should have the perfect immersion, right? Mm, not, not quite, because uh, interaction matters in VR. Uh, when I did my, my first VR demos, people always ask, uh, like, uh, like uh, regular people, well, where are my hands? I can see them. Uh, because the hands, if you, if you think about it, are like uh, a point uh, you connect uh, with reality. You, you all uh, can look off your, uh, at your hands and it's the only thing you see of your body or the main thing. When, when we work, we also look at our hands. So, so the hands are like the connection to reality for us. So this is why fully tracked controllers, and I mean like uh, really tracked uh, with rotation and translation, are pretty important because if you have a very good uh, well-tracked controller, you, you have a reference point in virtual reality where your hands are. And if you don't, you, uh, you just lose, uh, you just lose uh, a relation to reality. And this is also game-changing for uh, editing uh, in 3D. For example, if you do model editing, you, you, you can just sculpt stuff with your hands and productivity in general. If you want to be productive in virtual reality, uh, full room hand tracking or contro tracked controllers are very important. So uh, here on the bottom, we see the controller from the HTC Vive, um, which was bundled with the controller. Oculus. Um, wasn't as fast and the controller is still yet to be shipped later this year uh, but they uh, they uh, noticed that tracking of the hands and uh, a better interaction is very important so what can we do after that what's uh, what's even better than 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 having like vr track controllers of course it's natural interaction it's inter like interacting in reality so virtual reality becomes more similar and for that we need body tracking. This is uh, the Leap Motion camera. It's a stereoscopic uh, infrared camera which uh, in software has a model of the human hand and applies uh, the model to, to uh, the image and you get 
a pretty decent uh, or pretty well done experience with that and uh, it's the most immersive it can get because in reality we also just use our hands and um, the important thing is then the software and the interaction uh, you, you get in virtual reality and for that you use, usually need something that is called interaction engine. Um, that's a mixture of our classical input where we can say, oh yeah, the mouse is exactly at x30 uh, and y25 and it was exactly clicked so we exactly know that the button was pressed. But in virtual reality we need rather to do something like um, uh, collision detection with, with objects and it needs to be rather fuzzy. So elements from a physics engine have influence on, on the input engine and the whole thing is called interaction engine. And um, the idea is that we don't uh, need to see what the user does exactly but we need to figure out what the user wanted to do. So uh, the interaction engine needs to be smart, needs to outsmart the user so it gets, the user gets what he wants. And uh, when I bought my Leap Motion and tried the first demo, I wasn't amazed at all because they didn't figure out the software yet. But uh, this year in April at SVVR, I saw the, uh, the blocks demo from Leap Motion. And it's really amazing, it's really game changing. You can create like objects with your hands and throw them, and it's like a physics game. But. Uh, in virtual reality and with your hands. Uh, the demo was with the DK2, so a rather shitty resolution and bad tracking, but it was the best VR, the most immersive VR experience I had uh, until then. So natural interaction is even more important, uh, or interaction is even more important to immersion than the resolution of the display. And what else, well, what else can we do? Like, uh, Everyone thinks uh, about motion simulation when they think about VR, like being in a large sphere or something uh, and uh, being able to walk for any distance uh, unrelated to the physical space you're in. But maybe it would, won't be that relevant for mainstream for the next years because nobody wants to have such a huge thing in his uh, flat, even an uh, in enthusiast as me. I don't even know where to put it in my, uh, in my flat. And uh, maybe that's why they're working on it since three years. Uh, they announced the Kickstarter in 2013 and it's yet to be shipped. But of course, if you buy one, uh, I would like to try it. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I had, so I had a similar idea three years ago. I made a demo, it's called Hover. Yeah, with the funny VR in it. Um, so it's a, a demo with the Nintendo Wii balance board, and the balance board is nothing else than a scale, or, or rather four scales, and uh, they can measure where, where you have your, your body's balance. That means that you can do like skateboarding. And uh, I did a demo with the Blender game engine. Back then, Blender didn't have its own VR uh, bindings yet, so I made a wrapper uh, for OpenHMD for Python. Uh, it's called Python Rift, I guess. It should be called Python OpenHMD, really, and should maybe go upstream. Or I'm not sure what, uh, what's happened to it. I didn't work on it since then. And as well, a wrapper for WC, that's the, the driver that accesses just the four sensors. You just get four floats out of the balance board. And uh, the, the game was pretty well received. Uh, so it was nothing for people who get motion sick pretty easily, like me. But I have uh, uh, had like uh, some boys uh, with 13 aged that really loved this demo uh, because you could uh, go around fastly. Um, and Blender Game Engine was simulating all the physics. It has bullet physics. So the whole, all of the demo was free software. Um, right. So let's have a look at the available drivers. I was talking about OpenHMD. Um, so uh, these drivers are also available for Linux mo mostly. Uh, Valve, uh, uh, Valve's driver is uh, the implementation is called Steam VR, but uh, here I have Open VR. Uh, that's uh, rather Valve's specification. So Valve tried to do something like OpenGL. They specified an API for a VR driver. 
but uh, currently they have the only driver I know that's implemented in this API, uh, that implements this API. But um, maybe there will be some movement here, not sure. Um, and uh, what else do we have? So Sensix is a company uh, that did VR research for a couple of years where before it was cool and consumer available. So they wrote this C++ uh, driver uh, collection uh, that uh, wraps um, many controllers and other tracking methods uh, in VRPN. But VRPN is not relevant anymore as much because uh, it's completely included in OSVR. So um, OSVR is this um, software architecture where they try or they do, they wrap all the proprietary drivers into their API and uh, they try to have a connection to every game engine uh, and they really want to have uh, a platform where you, when you, uh, when you make your application available for OSVR, you can uh, get sure that you run on all the headsets. And that's a unique thing currently. And there are Apache, I think, the, they are Apache licensed. So they have an open source license. Um, of course, the proprietary drivers they're wrapping are not open source. And what else do we have? We have like OpenHMD, that's the driver I was uh, using three years ago already. Um, but it's very limited. OpenHMD just implements EMU tracking, so uh, no external tracking works there. Uh, but uh, they support uh, a decent amount of headsets. They support even the HTC Vive on a... Um, experimental branch, uh, they support, uh, they uh, pushed, last week they pushed Oculus CV1 support, and of course, so all of the Oculus series. And um, usually the O in all the drivers stands for open, but not for Oculus, it's the, uh, so here it stands for Oculus, uh, and it's not open at all because uh, they dropped all, uh, also Linux support after they were acquired by Facebook, and uh, there is no proprietary Oculus driver anymore on Linux. Of course, you can run the historical one, but it's getting uh, har harder and harder to get it running. Uh, but there you have, you still have uh, with the DK2 external tracking. Um, right. So what does a VR driver actually need to do? So uh, it's not that complicated. In, in print, uh, basically, you need to retrieve the headset transformation, obviously. And this headset transformation is mm, usually just uh, four floats. So it's one quaternion uh, where the transformation, uh, the rotation is encoded. And if you have external tracking, then you also get a 3D vector, so three more additional floats. It's not that much, but it needs to get transferred, of course, as fast as possible, so the tra tracking uh, is accurate. Then uh, this uh, information, this tracking position, will need, needs to be just applied on your camera, in your renderer, you render stereo which is like uh, a not VR exclusive thing. And uh, then you apply the lens uh, distortion and you're done, you have your VR application. So basically it's just these two things that the VR driver actually needs to do. Uh, so what's this barrel distortion? Um, so um, usually if we wouldn't have lenses in the VR headsets, uh, then there would be much unused space uh, because we would just see um, the screen itself, but uh, when we apply the lens, we can encode much more information, a uh, much larger field of view uh, on, on the screen, and uh, therefore we, we have a bigger field of view, which is very important uh, in VR. So this, the distorted image looks like that. This is what you usually see when you have barrel distortion. And this is what uh, the GL um, uh, test source, uh, it's the old GL test source without the noise, uh, looks like if you distort it with uh, my HMD warp element. So maybe this is an image you're used to. Okay, so let's uh, talk about some more feature buzzwords you, you see, maybe encounter when you, when you talk about VR drivers. So uh, asynchronous time warp is a pretty popular one. It's also uh, 
uh, called ATW. Uh, so John Carmack did that at Oculus, and basically it's uh, it's probing the the headset position, the headset rotation before the final rendering. So the first step is to to render the image in the engine with, with the in, uh, with the rotation you know until then, and then before applying the barrel distortion in the in the shader pass in the 2D image pass you apply a, a transformation there. But it gets complicated if you want to also do translation. So it's rather limited to, to a rotation. So it's rather faking a little rotation after the actual rendering. So this is what that's about. Uh, we also have simultaneous multi-projection. So this is a big NVIDIA buzzword. Uh, they introduced this feature in their current hardware generation. So it's only available on Pascal. And so the main issue is that if you render stereo, you have to render two images. So th this means, do the math, that you have half of the frame rate. Uh, and that's a huge problem. Uh, so they try to, to uh, limit this uh, amount of re repetitiveness with, uh, with, a, with a vertex stage that just needs to run once. So uh, you have... Uh, you don't need to render all of the pipeline two times, but uh, you just need to render uh, the, the, the later the fragment stage two times. And Valve also has something similar in Source Engine, and it's called Single Pass Stereo. So what else do we have? Um, direct rendering, or di direct, rather direct mode, um, which is a feature uh, implemented in uh, NVIDIA and AMD drivers uh, on Windows, so it was introduced with the DK2, uh, and it's rather just a compositor feature, so the desktop does not get rendered on the HMD. So you have the HMD exclusively for VR applications, and you uh, can uh, be sure that uh, Windows doesn't fuck up the, the frequency of the HMD, so it runs, because it's very important that the HMD runs at 90 Hertz in the case of this one, or 75 in the case of the DK2. Um, and if you're building always VR on Linux, you need to disable that, otherwise it will fail. Because on Linux we don't have um, like the buzzword direct rendering thing. Uh, I think you can just uh, many people state that it's not necessary because on uh, X11 you get a faster uh, rendering than on uh, Windows with direct rendering. But um, I think uh, Wayland, the Wayland protocol should be in the future should be more aware of HMDs, and there are some ideas at Collabora R&D uh, that could be done uh, at this point. And. Um, so, uh, in, but in uh, always VR currently, it's like a Windows only feature and it's very annoying, you need to disable it, but you don't get like slower rendering bef because of that. It's just, for me, it's just a compositor feature. So let's talk more about always VR. Um, they have a nice logo. So uh, I, uh, this is not my slide, uh, this is actually a slide from the Zensix uh, CEO. Uh, so the idea be, uh, be behind OSVR is that uh, usually every game engine would need to, to implement every driver API. For example, here the remote is also used uh, in, uh, in VR applications uh, very frequently, or the Kinect, the thing that's here, um, or Lighthouse. And on mobile you have uh, like Cardboard. Uh, and stuff, and OSVR should wrap all of them uh, to have like one platform. Uh, and uh, currently, uh, so they, they uh, have not everything implemented yet. For example, the CryEngine uh, is not here, but they have wrappers for SteamVR already, Unity, and Unreal. Uh, but currently it's pretty difficult to get them running on Linux. I was unsuccessful by doing that, by, but there is a Blender box. It's not on the slide, but Blender also uh, includes, uh, it supports OSVR. They did like a Python wrapper for OSVR, for the OSVR API, and um, you can use Blender there. And maybe GStreamer could also belong to other because I'm planning to support OSVR in the VR plugins in the future. 
I think it's a platform uh, that makes sense to support. So what components do we have in OSVR? It's like the OSVR core. That's the thing that uh, defines uh, all the paths you have for the different headsets or uh, uh, sensors you can, uh, you can query. Um, and the other thing, so that's, that's step one from the slide before. And uh, OSVR Render Manager is optional, so you can do the rendering and the, the HMD warp in your engine, but you can also use like the common OSVR Render Manager infrastructure uh, to get uh, the barrel distortion and the asynchronous time warping done. Uh, and then there are like plugins for every, for every headset and for every engine. Uh, for example, this OSVR, OSVR Vive uh, Libre uh, is, or Vive Libre, not sure, uh, is a project I'm working on currently at Collabora R&D. Uh, we try to make a fully open source OSVR driver for the Vive uh, without any uh, proprietary dependencies because that's what they just usually do. Uh, they probably don't have the capacity to to do it from scratch from lib USB every time. So uh, that's it for, for, for drivers and hardware. Let's, let's think about an application of VR, and that's spherical video. So uh, humans like to project stuff on other things than, than a plane for having like bigger immersion. Um, this is a panoramic drawing. It's very epic. I saw it as a child. Uh, it's in Wrocław. Um, and it's from like 1894. When you walk around, you just uh, can look at this epic battle, uh, and it's uh, quite immersive because in a museum, you, you just you usually you just see one picture and it's uh, just a frame. Uh, of course, it's very hard to do that, uh, like. Um, as a art uh, drawing, as a painting, but uh, since uh, since we have virtual reality and uh, panoramic cameras, we can do that more easily. So uh, this is actually a cylinder, but le let's look at the best shape we can use um, for mapping imagery on it. So uh, a shape that defines our whole field of view, our whole world is of course the sphere. In the sphere, we have the inclination, that's the, the angle that can go between 0 and 180, and the, the azimuth, uh, that's phi, so theta and phi, uh, and phi can be 360. So, oh yeah, 360. You know, 360, the, the number that is always mentioned when you think about panoramic video. But 360, uh, the number is not that fitting if you want to describe like the full sphere experience because there are many shapes that have theta, uh, phi equals 360. For example, a cylinder like in the panorama we, saw ju we just saw in the painting or maybe a cone. It's rather unusual to ra map video around this, but a hemisphere has also a theta equals 360. So it's uh, rather... Uh, better, it's more descriptive uh, to use another measure, uh, the solid angle. You maybe know from your computer graphics lecture. Um, so the so solid angle, um, it's, uh, the, the unit is steradian and it describes a 3D angle. So we can uh, describe, uh, for example, the full sphere. And uh, the, uh, it's just an integral uh, around the whole sphere. So uh, theta and phi between 0 uh, and 180 and 0 and 360. And the function is just a sine from theta. Uh, and then you can calculate that. And uh, yeah, if you want to be cool and descriptive, then you say 4 pi steradian video because that describes the full sphere. So 4 pi steradian is the full sphere and 2 pi steradian is the hemisphere. So um, yeah, just keep that in mind. But if you Google, if you YouTube, uh, if you're on YouTube, uh, you need to search for that because people don't usually don't know about that. So. <laughs> But uh, yeah, we can do some cool calculations with this. Um, so these numbers I have from duckok.org. It's a very cool VR block. So the Vive, this, this headset again. So uh, the Vive has two opening angles. I didn't uh, take these angles from the box because even on the Vive box, they only mention one angle. And uh, that's the horizontal field of view. Uh, 
uh, but we all, for, for calculating the, the solid angle of the wife available, we also need like the, the vertical field of view, obviously. And we just integrate this uh, and we have a result of 2.67 steradians. So this is the field of view in solid angles of, of the wife. Uh, if you don't trust me on this calculation, I did it on Wolfram Alpha, you can just put it in. And uh, yeah, then we uh, just need to calculate how many pixels the wife has, and uh, we have a result of 970 kilopixel per steradian. So this is the density, the room, uh, the solid angle pixel density of the wife. That's a very interesting number because we can do that with the spherical YouTube video as well. Uh, so we have a 4K spherical video on YouTube, so we just need to divide it by 4 pi steradian, so this is the solid angle of the full sphere, and we get a resolution of a, a pixel density of 586 uh, uh, kilopixel per steradian. So we see 4K is not enough for your wife, so uh, we need like 8K or something, uh, at least for this headset, to have uh, the same pixel density that the device supports. Um, let's take a look on some cameras. Uh, it's just some random cameras I came up with. I, if, you, if it's not your f favorite camera, it's not among them. I'm very sorry, I just uh, didn't uh, see it. So uh, that's the, a professional camera as I saw at SVVR. Uh, I like it because it looks like a face. But besides that, um, yeah, it has eight sensors. Um, the, the very important thing about this camera is that uh, the sensors uh, are adjusted uh, with a distance like you would have on your eyes. So uh, every, every pair uh, could be a pair of eyes looking uh, to on the top and on the bottom, to the left and to the right. And it does uh, the full sphere and in stereo. So uh, basically it does two full spheres. Uh, in post-production. So I saw uh, the live demo I saw uh, was not that amazing, the stitching was pretty bad and it was not stereoscopic, but stereoscopy is not that important anyway. Uh, the price recently dropped, if you want to get one it's just 45k. Um, but if you want to have a more affordable one, I also don't want to make any commercial or what, but I also saw this camera on the same expo. Uh, it's like 300 bucks. I won't use it uh, because it has a proprietary API, but basically you have two wide angle sensors, um, which is a very common type of setup for, for spherical video, um, because uh, a wide angle, a fisheye lens, usually is able to, uh, to measure half of the sphere. But if you want to do it yourself, get like a mount uh, like this, you can then put together your, your eight GoPros and do the software yourself. So um, this is rather a uh, do-it-yourself setup. Um, and uh, uh, what I've also found was Facebook uh, did like this design, it's, freely, uh, it's free to copy, so they have like all of the design and uh, also uh, soft reference implementation on how they do the stitching and stuff, so if you're interested in that, uh, you, I would look at that, but uh, it's mixed license, so not everything is free, uh, the, uh, the implementation is proprietary, the parts of it are BSD, and the design is Creative Commons, uh, but there is a reference software and there's an article if you keen on how they do the stitching because it's the hard part of uh, doing like the camera part of things. But I don't do that, I don't have a camera. Uh, for me, the adventure begins with this. It's the equirectangular projection. It's a very common projection in computer graphics. If you want to put a texture on a sphere, it makes sense. It's from cartography originally. So if you unwrap the earth with the equirectangular projection, it looks like this, very common. And if you uh, unwrap a, like a photo, uh, or do your stitching and your calculation in your pre-production, then it looks usually like that. And that's what the GST VR plugins support. So, um, yeah, uh, I maybe start with an anecdote from three years ago when I got my uh, DK1. Uh, I wanted to use GStreamer on it and uh, back then I didn't have the time or the talent to implement tracking uh, so I just used side-by-side -side stereo. So side-by-side -side stereoscopic video is a format um, where, where you don't 
uh, necessary, it's not necessary counted as VR, but it's stereoscopic, so it's like 3D again in cinema. There's tons of porn for it, so there was an application. And uh, so uh, people used that. I have a blog post about that. I uh, used the GL shader element, so it was like rather quick and dirty to do the lens, uh, the lens distortion, and it was basically it. Um, it's on my blog, but it doesn't work anymore. It was for GSD plugins, GL, uh, back then. So what do we have now uh, in the GSD VR plugins? Uh, I made, like, uh, mostly, most importantly, the VR compositor. So uh, this element uh, defines a sphere and does the texture mapping. Um, so uh, the pipeline can look like this. You have like the file source and stuff. You uh, do the uh, GL upload. And uh, very important is the video rate here, because uh, the, uh, you want to render uh, the tracked scene uh, on the uh, frame rate, on the frequency of the headset, uh, where the file source usually has like a shitty frame rate of just 30, and we need to render for the wife at 90, for example. So if you don't do this, uh, people will get sick because if you want, uh, you move, if you move your head, you just want to have the ha highest frame rate. So, uh, that's also why I have the caps filter here because the file source has a totally different aspect ratio than uh, what we render on the H. HMD. And as a post process, I have the HMD warp element where you can just uh, where what you you can just apply it to anything and have like this barrel distortion. So what I also did is uh, why I called it GS, GSD 3D. Uh, it contains a class for for mesh generation, so I am able to uh, generate a, a sphere and uh, like a coordinate system visualization, and also a planar point cloud and stuff like that. And um, yeah, uh, the the f basic mapping of the spherical video is done with a vertex definition and UV coordinates. Um, but I also have an implementation that's only in the shader, so I do everything in the shader without geometry. Uh, it has the advantage of doing less, uh, but it has the disadvantage of uh, it's that it's difficult to add more things than a sphere because uh, the, the geometry is defined uh, as a function. And maybe you have some exotic uh, format where you want to do l uh, your texture mapping uh, your way, then it's m it makes more sense to define a mesh or to define the UV coordinates you need for your video. I also have like a small scene definition uh, where you can just put in some meshes and some cameras, uh, or just one camera. So I did a camera where you can uh, do uh, WASD controls like in a game engine. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure that it currently is used, but the code is around. Uh, the Arcball camera is the camera you have when you have no HMD connected. So you can, with your mouse, you can rotate the sphere and look at the spherical video like on Google Street View. And of course, there's the HMD camera, which uses Open HMD as a backend. Uh, but I plan to use OSVR in the future as well. And yeah, it does like stereo rendering and stuff. And it's based on the G it's heavily based on the GL plugins. So uh, the the stuff you saw uh, here, uh, the VR compositor and the HMD warp are both GL filters. And maybe some of the stuff could go into GL plugins. But yeah, I need to clean it up and talk about upstream uh, politics and stuff. So uh, I also have uh, like Sphere. It's a, uh, right now it's a cool logo, but not more than a Python script. Uh, it could be a cooler GTK uh, VR video player in the future when I have more time to work on it. Uh, but currently it's like a Python script that detects your headset. Uh, and when I mean your headset, I mean the DK2. But it knows which screen it's on and it does like full screen. It works only on GNOME currently. And it launches like the pipeline with the correct headset resolution, and it opens a second sync uh, that you see on your uh, PC display because uh, we need two actually two syncs to for for the guy on the HMD to see something and uh, the people without the HMD to see on the monitor. So uh, y this is also a difficulty in VR games because you want to see the stuff the, p the person on the headset sees. So you basically need to not only render the scene two times for the stereo on the headset, but al also a third time for the audience. So this is why VR needs so much computation power.
so there is also, we, we talked about cameras and uh, spherical sensors, but of course there's also computer-generated panoramic stuff. And there we don't have the problems with stitching, uh, it just works, you, you can uh, set like uh, this, this projection in your renderer and uh, generate videos like that. So this is a Pac-Man video from, from YouTube. Uh, and John Carmack uh, talked about this when he saw a demo from uh, Otoy from their Octane engine, uh, Octane engine. It's a path tracer, so it has very good rendering quality. It looks like real, and he's, uh, it was like a furniture scene, a kitchen or something, where what you can very easily and very realistically render in computer graphics nowadays. So uh, he said that this was the best spherical uh, experience he ever had because of the um, big detail. Uh, and uh, and you don't see any seams and stuff like that. You usually have when when the stuff comes from the real world, so from cameras. Um, but the problem is even even if we render it at uh, the best quality uh, in a in a path tracer, spherical video has its limits. So uh, usually, if you have stereoscopic spherical video, that means for every eye there is one of these pictures. Uh, these pictures were recorded uh, with a camera setup where one eye is like uh, next to the other in a plane. Uh, and you cannot move this plane, you cannot rotate this plane where, where the, the camera was set up uh, after the recording. That means we only have two degrees of freedom. So in spherical video, even as a, so in spherical video, if you want to have real stereoscopy, so anisotropic stereoscopy, uh, that means that it's uh, from all angles, uh, the quality is the same, because uh, you, you, you are not able to do it. So. Um, um, you can only uh, look like uh, up and down and left and right. If you do the roll, then you lose correct stereoscopy. It's not possible to encode this in like two buffers. Um, and you ov obviously don't have any translation. You cannot move around in the scene. You're in the fixed point where, where the camera was. So it's not possible to walk around objects. It's a very limited uh, experience in terms of virtual reality. But uh, how, how do we get the reality without modeling and stuff like that? How, it, how could we get uh, the reality, the actual reality into VR with, with recording? And the answer for that, uh, for me at least, is stuff like this, like, uh, like the Kinect. Uh, it's a, a selfie of me uh, I did uh, in, in ROS. Uh, it's a point cloud recorded uh, on the Kinect. Um, this is uh, just black and white, but uh, of course you can uh, do it with color. And uh, this is my aloe vera, it's a plant. So uh, yeah, and you see the artifacts when you rotate the scene. So uh, this scene can actually be rotated after the recording, that's the point. Uh, and you, you, you can look behind it. But uh, the more you rotate it, obviously, the, the, be the, the worse the quality gets. Uh, and you have artifacts like these shadows. Um, but there are techniques uh, where you can reduce at least these artifacts. So again, I did a demo uh, in 2015 uh, at university. This is my professor and some guy. And uh, the, with, I, I managed to get two DK2s and two Kinects, uh, which I was very amazed about. Uh, and I did this demo called HoloChat, where two people were separated by gigabit LAN and to like five meters. Uh, needed, needed a very strong connection for that and I streamed the data, the point cloud with ROS. So if you don't know ROS, it's usually used in robotics. Robots need to be aware of, uh, of the environment for, for algorithms like simultaneous localization and mapping slam. Uh, you need point clouds and you create point clouds on the fly and you, uh, uh, and you transmit point clouds over the network. So this is why I used ROS and I just made a hacky implementation of the point cloud viewer uh, for VR and uh, the demo was done. If you want to have this hacky implementation, then it's on my GitHub. Um, right, uh, 
So that's the example pipeline for, yeah. All right, I, I wanted to implement that in GStreamer. Okay, next slide. So, um, yeah, uh, so I wrote a source for the Kinect. So this is this device. Um, and uh, it uses the libfreenect2. Uh, this is a free software Kinect driver. Uh, it's able to do the reconstruction of the point cloud from the depth sensor uh, with an open CL backend, with a CPU backend, and with a CUDA backend, and also with an open GL backend. So you, you will be fine. And um, so I made an element, it's called point cloud builder. It takes, uh, so I didn't annotate it, but it takes the, the grayscale depth buffer from the uh, calculated on the free NECT driver and uh, maps it onto a point cloud. And so this is the point uh, what you would tr currently transmit over the internet. Um, uh, so you just transmit the depth image. Problem currently is the demo doesn't look that nice because I use uh, the uh, the 16 bit integer grayscale buffer in GStreamer, and I will need to implement uh, a 32 bit float grayscale buffer, which is not available yet, in not only in GSD video, but in GL upload and mostly in GL color convert. Uh, and um, yeah, do, to, to actually get a decent quality point cloud, which I didn't do yet. Uh, so. Uh, I was recently also doing like uh, Vive driver stuff, and that's why the GST VR plugins didn't get so as much love. But in the uh, future, uh, you will be able to see a demo like this. And so, what is the dream? What is the dream about this? So the, um, uh, every uh, every user could just get a device like that, maybe not as big and with so many power plugs. Uh, but in the future, it will be quite easy to have like a depth sensor in your uh, in your laptop, and uh, we could do. Um, upload these, these depth buffers onto the server and the server would do a merging of the point clouds. He would uh, merge the point clouds into one scene, then uh, uh, process them and uh, you will be able to stream them, for example, as a compressed vertex mesh or uh, as a point cloud, whatever. But uh, yeah, this will be Twitch in 3D in VR. So this is like the idea. Um, there's one project, so there are other alternatives to the Kinect, uh, but uh, I don't have any, so this is the Kinect V2, it's very cool. Um, but uh, what uh, has more potential to get mainstream is the Google project Tango, so they, will, uh, they are putting depth sensors into, uh, like time of flight cameras into their tablets. So how can you remove some artifacts of these? So uh, I, I didn't read the paper uh, when I did the photos of my aloe. It's just a coincidence that they also have an aloe, but it's very, uh, very funny. So um, yeah, uh, you can remove uh, artifacts from, from a point cloud rendering with the so-called uh, hierarchical hole filling. So it's a post process, it's a, a 2D filter. It's GPU accelerated. How does it work? So we have these holes, these black holes. We uh, interpolate it to a smaller image and then even smaller until they are gone. And then we interpolate it back again. Uh, this was a GIF once, but I exported the talk as a PDF, so it's not. Okay, and what else can we do? We can do mesh reconstruction. Um, so we have these point clouds and then we have a this is not a very nice vertex mesh, but it is one. And the vertex mesh, in theory, can have less data because we have less vertices than points. Cool, I have time. Do I have time for the demo? Not about 10 minutes over oh, uh, yeah. So you can, you can see the demo on GitHub. And if you, yeah? Yeah, okay. Um, okay, so I will just show a short demo. Um, Let's see, yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> this should work, I hope. Ah yeah. But, no, 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 that's not. Um, <laughs> Oh, this this one. This one. This one. Yeah. Okay. 
Oh, right, right, right. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, so the HMD demo doesn't work. Um, let's see if the Connect demo works. Um, Okay, okay, interesting. So when I tried it yesterday, the demos worked. So oh. Oh, that's that's an error, right? Cool. Nice. Uh, so this is the depth buffer uh, from from the Kinect, and uh, yeah, uh, we have. Uh, so uh, if I change source type here, I can uh, access all the different buffers from the Kinect, like uh, the, the color buffer, and uh, I can also um, so this is the point cloud. Uh, it's uh, as I said, it looks very shitty, but you can see uh, this is uh, the. Uh, it's a GST 3D scene where, w and I have like input in the, I'm using um, uh, the GST navigation API to do the, the, the input stuff. Um, let's try another one. Uh, uh, so I made a thing called G a VR test source. Uh, it's like GL test source. Um, so it doesn't current this demo doesn't have stereo, but this is the sphere I did. So uh, this is all in GStreamer, and uh, this is the uh, uh, arcball camera where I can just look at stuff. So this is this uh, sphere definition. Too bad the HMD doesn't work. I think it's as trivial as one cable is not plugged or something, but I, I don't have the time to figure it out now. Uh, just get the demo from GitHub, so yeah. Um, and so the last slide after the demo is, uh, yeah, do you have any questions? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, we don't have time for questions, so that's it, uh, yeah, thanks. <laughs>